Good morning, everyone. My name is Justin Curtis. I will be the moderator today. Um, welcome to From Dreams to Reality, Designing a Personal Recording Studio. Um, we have a lot of people here today. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending up uh, from Kenya. Blaine, 7 p.m. there. Um, yes, we will be recording this. It will be posted on WSDG.com and our, our YouTube channel. Um, We'll be using the Q&A feature for questions today. We'll try to get through them. Uh, we're logging all the questions. So if we don't get to a lot of them, which is often the case because there are so many, we will follow up individually afterwards. Um, but yes, the recording will be available. And um, yes, that, that is that. Um, so without further ado, I would love to introduce um, the next generation of partners at WSDG. Sergio Molo, partner and CEO of that Latin office, and Joshua Morris, partner and CEO of the New York office. Hi, guys. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon for you. Good morning for me. Good day. <laughs> hey, hi, everybody. How are you guys all over the world? Thanks for joining. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I will let you guys take it away. I know we've got a packed session today. Um, uh, anything else you guys want to share with uh, the attendees prior to me just going into the background and monitoring the Q&A for you? No, just we're going to have some fun. We're talking about our passion, that is music, sound, acoustics, technology, and uh, how to drive from one dream to the reality of making that dream come true. That's the topic of today. Let's make a recording studio together today. Love it. Okay, well... Enjoy, and I'll be talking to you throughout, as uh, noted for all of the participants uh, or the attendees. I'll be monitoring Q&A, and I will try to get those questions in front of Sergio and Josh as best I can. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, yes, that's... Sergio, that's... It, it might be interesting to mention that we're both musicians first, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, musician first, sound engineer later, producer later, uh, kind of acoustician because of designers. our professional designers of professional trade and but a hundred percent passionate about this subject okay that is how to make spaces and how to make magic spaces correct josh absolutely okay so let's jump to it let's go for it joshy let's go okay so let me share my screen guys you know the drill and okay we got it right let's go so we're going to talk about how to make a recording studio from dreams to reality and uh, at wcg we have the luxury of having this experience every day of our life every day we are we are having the, the chance of meeting with people musicians engineers producers business people that wants to create a space to make music, okay, for whatever that purpose is. And we divided our lecture today, our webinar today in four sections. We are going to be distributing this uh, subject with, with Josh in different moments of the lecture. We're going to have a brief introduction of the Project Studio Parade, different types of uh, studios that we've been always worked before. Um, we're going to have a section related to acoustics, a, a little baby acoustics, but something that we can level our understanding of the subject. Uh, then we're going to have one case study that is the Prisonus facility in, in Luciana. And uh, at the end, we're going to have some eye candy, let's call it that way, of interesting studios. Okay, so let's, let's go for it. So what is the challenge here? Why, why on how we start all this conversation um, and how we make it happen. Uh, the challenge is to unite the disciplines of architectural, acoustics, and technology in one uni unified discipline and trying to understand how to make that happen, how to interact, how those traits will interact to each other, how we can make in a space that is acoustically accurate, that sounds good, and it's quiet, quiet enough within the community that, we, that is placed. So, how we do that? First of all, we have, when we start the project, we have to listen to the client's needs. That sounds like obvious and 
almost a quack to an acoustician that needs to listen, but this is very important. Uh, we need to understand exactly what is the need of the project, what, what will happen inside of the space, and for that to happen, we need to create a strong program, okay? And we, have, we need to have a written agreement of the project, and, the project and, and we can need to understand the project. That integration between the architecture, that is the space where the project will be located, the acoustics, that is the technical need, and the technology integration, needs to be integrated in one design effort because in the end it's one space that needs to operate. And the art of design, the design of the vision, the design of the architect, the design of the interior designer, the design in all terms of purpose, and the size of acoustics needs to work together at the same time. So that's, those are the things that we need to address. And every studio, Every student in the world, whatever shape, whatever size, is a custom-made studio. We don't believe in copy-paste facilities. We, as every project has its own characteristic, its own user need, every studio is custom-made. And that's why we call this lecture or this webinar From Dreams to Reality, because, because everything starts with a dream, with a need or a dream or a vision, and we, in our train, we need to convert those dreams, that vision, into the reality that can be built, that can be shared within different stakeholders and different professionals that will particip participate in that, and then make it happen, finish it, certify it, and use it. So let's, let's talk about the different type of projects. We, we've seen that before, you know, the desktop studio, the garage studio, never more garage than this. This is a garage studio that is basically a garage. Okay, the cabin studio, we love this one, okay, very cute, in the middle of nowhere, okay. The, the Wolfson studio, we did that at the uh, uh, Lower East Side Girls Club, uh, it's been published a lot, but this is a very interesting idea. And then all the other gigantic array of types of studio, basically rooms where we put gear and we make music, okay. Doesn't matter how thin the proportion how crazy the room is, how crowded the room is, different styles, but always with the same goal. Someone is trying to create music, mix it, post-produce it, and have a final product. Sometimes with more intelligence, sometimes with less intelligence, doesn't matter, okay? Because the goal is always the same, okay? And the, the beauty of this is that this is related to the human experience and to the need of that person, okay? And that is what creates us the opportunity of having a huge array of finishes, looks, vibes that will attend that. But in all cases, in all cases, there are certain acoustic fundamentals and certain guidelines that we can take care of. And if we do it professionally, we have more chances of having a very nice sounding space. And I will pass the torch for a second for the, to Josh to talk about how this design process starts. Right, so a critical part of this process is to figure out, you know, what you want from your space, right? And that has everything to do with uh, who you have on your team, what their skills are, uh, what their backgrounds are, what they can bring to the project, and also what exactly you're trying to accomplish. Uh, with regards to programming. Um, the programming basically encompasses what are your project goals, right? Are you, is your control room supposed to be big enough to fit five people in? Does your live room need to be sized for a choir? Um, do you only need a small vocal booth for overdubs? You know, that sort of thing, that's all programming. Um, what sort of requirements you need to, to make your space a reality. But at the same time, we also have to look at uh, parameters such as acoustic uh, requirements like isolation, um, how loud you can be before you bother your neighbor, who is your neighbor, what's going to bother them, um, how loud your environment is so that uh, you can still work if, if your environment is being loud. Obviously, an urban setting is going to be different than a rural one. What are the uh, acoustic qualities of, of the space? You know, are you creating a project studio where you're just going to crib uh, and work on some beats 
Um, are you basically only doing mixing uh, and therefore need just a control room that, that, is, uh, that translates to other environments? Um, are you tracking large groups? Are you mastering? You know, all of these sorts of questions need to be answered. Um, how many people are you supporting? Are we going to have five production rooms that are identical um, and so forth? Uh, what are your needs from, from, from the infrastructure, right? From, from the power, electricity, do you have an elevated electricity need? Um, typically, that need has, has been reduced lately because of you know, tr uh, improvements in equipment, improvements in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the HVAC, less cooling is required. Um, so we have to define all of these things, what technology you're using, consoles, speakers, profited speakers, you know, all of these things, all of these questions that we have to ask ourselves what, what our room needs to do and how that fits into the built environment, which calls into question you know, HVAC electrical structure. Can, can you fit it in, this, in the existing conditions? Do you have to build a new uh, existing condition? You know, do you have to build a new shell? That sort of thing. And then ultimately what it wants to look like, right? What's the vibe? Um, typically, you know, in, in days past, um, I don't even know if we can define how long ago this was, but to get a studio built, you used to go to like a single person who would act as all of these roles. They would be designer, builder, manufacturer, MEP engineer, um, and AV integrator, sort of a, a one-stop shop, if you will. But as things have gotten more complex, as our specialization has increased, um, increasing body of knowledge, we, um, our roles have gotten more complex to reflect that, right? Usually now the designer is separate from the builder. Uh, the designer works in conjunction with MEP engineers, structural engineers to determine uh, heat loads and duct routing to determine the resonant frequency of your structures. Um, hey, Josh. Uh, and then that, also an AV integrator there at the end. Hey, Josh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I've got a, an interesting question coming in. Do you guys at WSCG have a standard form for programming, something that a, literally a novice could just fill in to kind of address all of these things you're talking about? Typically, um, we do have a form that we use to basically kind of get a, like a checklist of questions to ask when, when a potential client calls. Um, although, Usually that's just a starting point, right? A phone call is typically the best way to really sort this through. It's, a, it's an iterative conversation, right? What do you need? What do you want? What do you have? Where do you, what do you need to, to have? Um, and so that sort of evolves from that conversation. Yeah, yeah and, and also the reality check of the, of the site conditions. The site condition is usually marking the pace of the project, okay, because Maybe you have the dream and then, oh, but I only have eight feet tall building. So, okay, what you're trying to do is not feasible. Right. Uh, so, so that's a, it's a combination. We have some, some forms, as Josh mentioned, uh, that to start with, but then it's a one-to-one -one conversation with uh, ex exploring all the assets and all, the, all those needs. Great, that's thank it. you for that, you guys. It's as complicated as saying, you know, it's as, it's as simple and as complicated as, as something like, I want to I want to buy a boat, okay? And, I mean, that conversation could go so many places. And you need to have so many conversations until you figure out what boat is right for you, you know? So this, is, this isn't really any different. Uh, um, hopefully, everyone on this call has a lot of experience buying boats. I don't, but... I don't either. <laughs> I have, I've, I've, I've just bought a paddleboard, so that's, oh, that's as close go. as I'm going to get for a while. Um, we can go to the next slide if you want. Yes, of course. Um, and that's where we get into the all important order of operations, right? This is a really good metric to, to talk about the life of a project from, is that from the initial, like the acorn of the idea uh, to the oak of the actual built project from, from dream, like we said, to reality, uh, from the first sketch or the first equipment list or the first time you realize that, oh, my current space is just not really doing it for me. And in order to, to bring my work to the next level, I, I need a, a space that will allow me to do that to the opening night. 
And this sort of reads, you know, left to right. We we'll start with the, the fine schematic design. We want to stay loose. We want to try to get all the cards on the table. Um, the second phase, the design phase, we, we sort of color those in, we refine those, um, and start to assign uh, some personality to those uh, based on what you are and what you want to accomplish, where you want to be. And then we develop those. We bring in our partners, uh, MEP, we bring, bring in structure. Now that we have, now that we know where we want to go, we, we, need, we need help to, to arrive there. Um, uh, then, sorry, um, sorry, Justin, maybe it's a good moment to, to throw the poll on the vibe, about the vibe of the studio, because I think that as, as artists, we are all very concerned that our space is creative. Uh, so if you, if you guys, if you can just feel whatever you I'll, think is appropriate. I'll keep for that you. up for about a minute and a half. Okay, thanks. Obviously, you know, we like to think the vibe is, is pretty important, not to sway the poll, uh, but you know, if you know, inspiration has a lot to do with music, I think um, if you're an inspired passage can sound different than you know just this one that you're cranking out. Uh, which is not to say that you shouldn't work on your craft and wait for inspiration, but inspiration is usually a factor. Uh, and then we get into the detail phase, which is where we start to really you know to, you know refine and put everything organized, uh, say exactly what's on the walls, exactly how the ducks are going to get there, exactly where you need what kind of power, that sort of thing. Those can be 2D as, as they have been traditionally. Uh, 3D, which is where uh, WSDG is at most of the time. Now we do most of our, our uh, design work in, in three dimensions. Or 4D, which is where we bring in the temporal uh, quality walkthroughs and, and site, you know, light, lighting studies and that sort of thing. And then arguably, you know, maybe the, the longest phase for sure, uh, construction. Um, you know, that this little, uh, this little part right here is from a calendar standpoint, possibly the most lengthy, uh, depending on what we're doing. Uh, and then we have to test it and uh, tune it, and, and then we can go use it. Results of the poll are in, and everyone seems to agree that, and probably because I, I said that. And I yeah, Josh. Everybody. I appreciate everybody um, <laughs> agreeing with me. I'll try not to do that in the future, but by very important. And, uh, you know, getting the artist in the right headspace, getting, your, getting you in the right headspace is, is very important. So I'll it back to you, sir. So, Josh, I, I think that we agree that, and watching this complex uh, uh, process sheet, that in every project, okay, no matter the size, even from a large 80,000 seat stadiums to a smaller stadium uh, to an arena, a state that is basically a stadium with a roof, uh, and, and those arenas in di for different uses, etc., etc., theaters, concert halls, uh, corporate uh, lecture halls, small auditoriums. So all these projects, okay, no matter the size, participate in this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, process, correct? Uh, it's, uh, we've been involved in this dialogue through the design phase and later through the construction phase in order to achieve all these goals and, uh, and have the full understanding of all the stakeholders of how to make this happen. Because in the end, we need everybody to be in the same page. We, in some cases, we need to educate some of the stakeholders, but they, because they are not used to deal with a professional recording studio or a lecture hall or a, even a rehearsal room that has these requirements. So no matter the size of the project, no matter how exclusive the studio is or how crazy the uh, the topography of the speaker's layout, in all these cases, a, 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 a schematic design, design development, construction documentation, uh, systems integration, and later a deep construction administration and supervision is required in order to get high profile projects and also a home studio. There is no difference. The, the, the process maybe is faster because we don't have to, we don't need to have 17 meetings to determine the color of the couch because the decision maker is one person, but 
in the end, uh, the process is, is the same for all projects. So from, from 80,000 people to one, from one person in one room, if you have a project, you have to think about this process coming up. And how we learned about this? Hey, we learned... Sergio. Yes. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have a question that I know, I'm not sure, I, I know we're going to address this at some point, um, but I just wanted to pose it to you. Any experience or knowledge regarding DML, distributed mode, loudspeakers, and planar wave technology, the audio industry is moving toward immersive, places like MSG Sphere, et cetera, using WFS, uh, HOA, phase array technology, et cetera. How will this impact studio design, content creation, and delivery? such as Dolby Atmos, Sony 360, and binaural? Okay, that's a complex question for this <laughs> moment of the lecture. But <laughs> le let's, you know, Justin, you have to choose your battles, my, fr I my friend. Well, I, uh, wasn't, I know that we're going to be talking about it. We are going to be talking about, uh, uh, about immersive audio and, and that evolution too. Give us, uh, put that question on the side, okay? And Done. let's let's continue with the with the lecture, and maybe some of those questions will be answered during the webinar. Okay, if not, we will have a Q and A specific moment uh, at uh, at the end. Okay, sorry for the question to, to not address it right now, but we have another hundreds of people here watching the, the webinar. That was really specific. Okay, so how this uh, audiovisual experience started? Okay. For the ones that have little hair or no hair like me, you remember listening to music with these kind of wooden cubes and different types of speakers, crossovers, yes, no, three-way, two-way, one-way, whatever. And it, it was a funky era where everybody was making speakers. There was very little standards, very, very little ways of proofing uh, what's going on regarding speaking manufacturing. And, and that means that affecting the audio experience, and then the, the Walkman arrives to our lives in the 70s, so now we're starting to also listen to music with earbuds, uh, with, with earbuds, and that changed everything because now the, there was an intimate relation between the listening and the content creator. And people listen to music, believe me, and you know all that in very different and odd ways, in crazy ways. But, you know, a lot of people are, you know, listen to music with the iPhones or the, the, the phones directly or whatever, a smart uh, device. So if people are listening, if a lot of people in our world are listening to music with this small earbud, why are we putting so much attention and so much effort to create fantastic and magic spaces? Okay, and the reason is that at the same time, there are people listening to music like this. So from the earbag to the million dollar listening room, that rainbow of spaces is why we are here. Because we are passionate about the content, we want to transmit and transduce that, uh, that content that we are creating in the best way. So someone on the other side of the chain, in whatever device, We'll, we'll be able to get our content in the best way possible, okay? And that's our, our synergy with the content creator, with the musician, the producer, the composer, and, and the space. That is what we are talking about today. And the same happened with the, with the audiovisual experience at home, okay? Remember, at the beginning we only have radio, okay? Then black and white TV, the black and white TV were so bad that we need to be really close to the device, if not, there was no able uh, to, to even to view or to listen to the content. Then, thanks the evolution, thanks NASA, we got color, we have stereo, uh, we have VCRs, we have video games, and but always that TV, that audiovisual content was part, impo an important part of the family. That means that all of us that we are in this industry, we are creating content for that individual person, but also for family, for people, for crowds, the later for live concerts, etc. And that, uh, that content is now being transmitted with interactive elements and, and our content creation, our studios, need to address that. Okay, so we need to understand this story because if you are designing today a space, you need to understand how that content will be listened or viewed, okay? And Today is more like an audiovisual experience. Um, and by the way, 
our recording studio industry, our recording spaces also evolved. Okay, remember the old studios back in the 50s, 60s, two spaces, engineers, white coat, you know, real engineer like engineers, like uh, scientists, and on the other side, a big barrier, the glass on the other side, the musicians, no, very little contact between each other. And that started to change in 1969 where our partner, our mentor, John Storick, DS of WZG, design Electric Lady Studios, okay? That was one of the first project studios or artist owned studios, a la carte studios built in the world, okay? And that trend is the one that drives all this evolution of different kinds of spaces with different kinds of vibes, styles, because we are now creating studios that will match in a specific need. That need could be sometimes the need of a commercial building or a, com or a business, but most of the time is the drive of the one that has the vision, the sound engineer, the producer, the musician, that needs a certain environment with certain standards, applying to certain standards to make magic happen. And of course, this is also a recording studio, okay? So we, you can have that recording studio in different, in different shapes, but what we are trying to aim to is spaces that can make magic. No matter if it's, it's a full orchestra or someone singing or, t or playing a flute on, a, on, a, on an ISO booth. Uh, that's the magic that we are aiming for and that's why we are also passionate about trying to find the best way uh, of building those spaces to match those dreams. And going a little deeper into that process, uh, we learned a few things during our 50 years of experience. Uh, one thing is that there is a kind of correlation between the planning and the construction timeline when it comes to an acoustic space, okay? That means that, first of all, both on planning and construction, we need to pay attention about on structural acoustics. That means how the sound will behave in terms of Con the control of the structural vibration, so anything that can generate noise through uh, structural vibration, like for example, if you are if you live in an apartment building and you have the subway below you, that vibration can generate low frequencies, and those low frequencies can go to your microphone, or maybe you have the chiller of uh, of the of the air conditioning on the top of your high riser, whatever that can create, get you noise through th that structural vibration. And of, and of course, noise and isolation is bi bidirectional. That means that if you hear, if you can listen that vibration, that means that you can also make some vibration that could bother someone else. Once we control this first subject, that sometimes is relevant, okay? Because if you build in a, a, a studio inside of a, a cabin in the middle of the country, there's no vibration noise that could affect you. Then we can go into the airborne isolation. Then we can take care of if we have sufficient noise isolation to our problem. Again, bidirectional, okay? Noise coming through the walls, the windows, the, windows, the doors, the floors, etc. Traffic, uh, traffic, neighbors, uh, internal neighbors, your own family could be the neighbor that you're bothering. So that needs to be addressed first. So the first advice, if you're going to build a studio, okay, and, you, yeah, and you're looking for a good first advice, okay, try to make it in a place where the structural acoustics will have the least amount of impact, okay, because that's where the money is when it comes to construction. And we're going to see that later, later in the webinar. Hey, so Joe, I've, I've got a lot of questions coming in that actually align to one of our poll questions, which is uh, a lot of people want to know, uh, what difference analog versus digital has on the design of your project studios? Uh, should I throw up that poll? Yeah, you can you can you can throw that poll uh, while I answer to that. <laughs> okay, r right now, uh, on a technology point of view, okay, I, I, as we were driving through through that, uh, the, there's no such difference between digital and analog technology use when we are building a studio. Although, if you are going to have an analog tape machine, you need the space for that. And, uh, and of course, the background noise when you're in full digital, it's lower. So your NC 
levels, your noise criteria levels, and in particular the live room, need to be as low as possible because every single bit will be, ca will be uh, captured by the microphones because you, you have very, very low background noise coming from the workstation, the, the recording device. Uh, Josh, you want to add something on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the analog stuff can be, trends a little bit bigger, right? The tubes are bigger, sometimes the boards you're using are bigger. I would say that, a, that an all digital approach is arguably, from a space allocation standpoint, smaller. Uh, so that's, that might be the impact from an architectural standpoint. Also, the analog stuff put off more, puts off more heat, so you tend to have uh, a greater heat load, and therefore you need more cooling uh, to take care of it. Yeah, uh, again, affecting that first programming that we discussed at the beginning of the lecture. Okay. Uh, and there's, uh, uh, there's, some, there's some poll results that uh, might suggest we need to make sure that we accommodate for those big tape decks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Landslide. Okay, <laughs> yes, that, that's good. So once we have that structural acoustic figured out, okay, and again, I'm talking to about a home studio, a garage studio, a, a large complex of studios, that's, it's the same, okay? That, that doesn't matter the size of your project, okay? Then we can jump into what we call the internal room acoustics and basically the qu acoustic quality inside of the spaces that we're talking about, okay? How the space will sound. Remember, you can have a perfectly isolated space that sounds like shit. Or you can have a pristine, lovely, finished recording studio and you cannot record because you're listening to the sirens, okay? Or you just need to do social control, okay? My studio, I only use it till 10 p.m. because after 10 p.m. I start bothering people surrounding me and that's not working. So isolation could be achieved physically by design or by social control. Room acoustics is more different, difficult. If you don't address uh, room acoustics, uh, it's very difficult to control it after the fact. So it's, you're going to have problems in producing your content. And once we have both issues, structural acoustics and room acoustics covered, then you can put an eye, a deeper eye on the technology integration. Although we are going to be talking about technology integration at the beginning of the planning process, it's, uh, in terms of the planning and implementation, it, ca it comes next. Okay? Unless, for example, we are doing a project right now where the, the theme of the project was I have a nine-foot Grand Concerto Steinway piano. And the project is surrounding that object, okay? But that's on a program point of view, we understand that we have that object, that that object needs to fit inside of the space, that we need a large space, uh, large enough to make that piano to explode and sound as beautiful as it is. But all the other aspects need to be addressed before. That's, a, that's the condition of the project. So let's jump to some acoustic fundamentals. Uh, I'm sure that this is pretty obvious for most of the people that are attending this lecture, but acoustics is a subtopic of physics and is the study of sound. And for that sound to happen, we need a change of pressure in a medium, and that medium right now is air, and then we have a lot of electronics going in and out. But we, we need that medium for those sound waves to basically travel through the air, in this case, and those sound waves will behave completely different on the frequency dependent. So the, 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 the lower frequencies or the lower tones or beats will fly in a different way and different speed as the high frequencies. They, they will move differently. And all these acoustic phenomena, okay, need to be studied as of being frequency dependent. That's the key. We have standards, we have, and we use standards for that purpose, that uh, maybe they are talking about what happens at one kilohertz, but we as acousticians, we are studying the entire uh, uh, broadband uh, of what's going on. And if we need a medium, that means that George Lucas lied to us. That means that there's no sound in space. That means that the Death Star, when it exploded, there was no boom. Yes. In reality, there was a boom, but we're not be able to listen to it. We, we see the light, okay, and, we, and if we are moonwalking uh, or start walking, we will listen to our breath inside of our helmet, but there's no sound in space because there's no medium. 
but that's an anecdote just for for a key. But you can you can listen to you can listen sound in, under the water. You can listen for structures and for the area, but not in space. That's that's for another lecture. Sound in space. The, the next uh, project studio will be in the space station. We'll have fun with that. So. All acoustical phenomena happens in three physical domains. Time, okay, we understand time. A phenomenon could be short or long, okay, time we can measure. Energy, decibels, we are all used to this value, okay, that's the, basically the volume, okay, the, the amount of energy, it could be soft or soft, okay, and then we have the frequency, okay, that's, that's our, uh, that's our important factor, okay? That's the heart, the beats. We can be very low and very high, and okay, let's. And here we go. Basically, the response from this 0 to 20 hertz sweep will depend on, on your transducer, your headphones, your speakers, and if you have some door, dog close to you, it will bark in after that file pop up. And, uh, and that's the magic because understanding those three elements, that's where acoustic, the acoustical phenomenon or those acoustic uh, physical elements combined with architect because this is the holy grail of acoustics, okay? Where lambda is the wavelength, C is the velocity of sound with its content. And when we study velocity of sound, we have this magic element, feet, dimension, meters. And by inverting this uh, formula, we find out that when lambda is smaller, okay, the number is smaller, the frequency is larger. That means that low frequency, 20 hertz, 40 hertz, that have a very long wavelength, okay, very, uh, and in, in, in burst, okay, when the frequency is higher, okay, that free, uh, the, the lambda is smaller. So that, uh, that's explain why we are, when we are outside of a nightclub, we only listen to the boom, boom, boom instead of the, the entire song. That, that, that's the reason. So boundaries are more efficient uh, con uh, containing those mid and high frequencies versus, versus low frequencies. And that's the key of our problem. Because when you're trying to do what we call a project studio or a home studio, a, a, a studio in, in, in a smaller environment, that low frequency management becomes critical because what happens with those long wavelengths that cannot fit inside of those rooms. That's why long frequency analysis is the hot topic in studio design today because of how we're going to manage that energy inside of smaller spaces. Okay, and again, as we start to talk about these projects, whatever project you're doing, a podcast studio, a, a music studio, a writing room, or a radio studio, we need to understand which are the frequencies that we are studying when we start to design the studio and what's the range, okay? It's completely different if you are a, vocal, a voiceover artist that you want to have a studio at home, you mostly have to take a look at what's happening on the vocal range in a, in, in a very specific dynamic range in terms of energy. If you're, if you're producing music, that, that means you have to take care of the entire, the entire range of frequencies and uh, levels. Okay, and, and that's, uh, this is an important slide because this slide could be the difference between spending tons of money in isolation and not. Because maybe you don't need the isolation. You don't need to listen so hard. That means you don't need so that, so complex, that, that kind of complex boundaries for isolation because you, as the sound making element, we are, you're not making that much noise. So that's why we need to pay attention to this at early stages. And of course, important, super important, site assessment. Let's try to understand what's going on, what's happening in the space that we are planning to have our studio. We can measure it. There are different tools, even some apps, very inexpensive apps for your phones that will allow us to get very good precise information of the existing conditions of this place where we're going to place the studio. And that could be the difference between spending a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy and things that we don't need. Okay, so a good first guideline, site assessment, site analysis, 
a clever understanding of my space and my need. And as it's, we so mentioned, Sergio, Sergio yes? we're getting a bunch of questions about um, people asking about the acoustics of a studio that has a serpent control room and a live room versus combined control room and live room. Um, can you guys talk a little bit to this issue? And yes, uh, I'm going to launch a poll related to it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Josh, you want to attack this subject? I think uh, this is a subject that is pretty actual today uh, under the COVID sure. circumstances. Again, I'm going to try not to sway the, the results. I Please don't. Have, I personally have a combined control room, live room, uh, where I do any recording that I do personally in, in, my, in, in, a, in a room that serves both tracking and mixing playback functions. But uh, there are a lot of artists that work this way. Um, there are a lot of artists and engineers who prefer to work with a dedicated uh, playback tracking mixing space and uh, sorry, a dedicated playback and mixing space and then also a dedicated separate uh, tracking space. Um, traditionally, they are separate. Uh, we have seen a trend towards them being combined on certain types of projects. Um, there's not a right answer. Be clear about that. Um, none, of, none of these have right answers, uh, but it's, it, we're curious to see if, if that's a, an emerging trend or if that's just based on the artists we've been working with or something like that. Um, do you, Sergio, do you guys have any examples of some of these rooms? People are wanting to see stuff. <laughs> uh, yes, it's coming, it's coming up. It's coming up. Yay! Promised. Promised. We, we're going to... So, as, as we are... Okay, so we have an answer here. Thanks. 70, 30. Look how clean. Wow. Okay, very nice. <laughs> and, uh, and again, talking about acoustics, and remember, this is, this is, an, uh, this is a webinar related to, uh, to understanding the process from that dream to reality. So this is, this is an important slide. Acoustics, although it's one subject, let's try to think about this as two lenses, correct, Josh? Isolation, transfer of sound, and internal room acoustic behavior, uh, and I, and I think that that's uh, that's critical to understand. The, the, if if you want to leave this lecture with one slide, this is one, okay. And uh, so, Josh, you want to talk about a little about I, isolation? I think I'm sure that this is a subject that you know that you have a vast experience in both mass and decoupling. You right. can jump on this. This is, um, you know, can be the most important element of many projects. Um, it certainly carries the lion's share typically of the construction budget. Um, and this is with, you know, this deals with either protecting your studio space from outside influences, acoustic outside influences, not ideological ones or anything else. Um, and or protecting the outside world from the noise that you're making in your studio. If you're laying down a drum track at 100, 110 dBA or whatever, um, and your baby is trying to sleep upstairs, that, you know, those two, those two aren't going to play well together. Um, so what you need to do is introduce mass and airspace in between those uh, directions so that you can protect the baby from the drums. Um, as opposed to if you're doing, say, a very, um, like a, 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 voice tra a voiceover track, um, maybe uh, reading a book, uh, tracking something to tape, and there's, your neighbor is moving the lawnmower, mowing the lawn outside. Um, that doesn't, you know, you're gonna have to wait till they're, till they're done. You don't have enough isolation to so that your microphone doesn't pick up that sound. Um, we did have a question come in uh, about this, and I'll read the question real quick. When WSDG encounters structural acoustic issues, are you typically addressing with local room isolation, addressing at the source, advising on a different site selection, or other methods slash all of the above? And, and it's a good question, and, and it really it's, it's project dependent, um, and, it, and it really depends on, on the goals of the project, right? Um, we could attack the source. Uh, in this case, let's say uh, there's a loud AC unit um, on a on a floor you're about to rent. Well, instead of you know trying to go and make the studios add a bunch of extra layers of sheetrock or 
or decouple and, and, and do spend all your money there, you could try to decouple the AC unit so that it's not vibrating the entire floor, you know, that sort of thing. So that's attacking the source. Um, you could increase your boundary design to do so. Um, or you know what, maybe that you can't, maybe you don't have the budget to increase your boundary design. Maybe the landlord won't let you touch the AC unit, in which case, you know what, you're never gonna be able to work when you wanna work at the temperature at which you wanna work, at the level at which you wanna work. Maybe we need to find another site. So it really depends. And that would be part of programming, which we mentioned earlier. In any case, the beauty is that we have this enough science today to anticipate what could happen before spending $1 in construction. So we, we understand the different types of partitions. We can simulate and determine what kind of isolation the SDC, the sound transmission class that each kind of partition will be able to give us. And with that information, we can start, that, that would be part of that programming analysis. And later, when, once we start with the design, we, we can determine, okay, we need more mass in that partition because we, we, that's, that's my enemy, that's, what, that's the, the type of noise that I have to beat, or uh, so by adding more layers of jib or different strategies, we can get that mass, that extra mass, or maybe we need a more sophisticated boundary system, like a box in a box or a room within a room, that is what is shown here in this, in this diagram, that is a much higher STC type of partition, and we have a decoupled floors with the couple walls and the couple ceilings, so all this, all this uh, element, okay, all this element is not in contact with this other element. Although we are all in the same planet Earth, we have the coupling swi braces or the wall decouplers. We have two different floors, okay, flooring floors and the ceiling is not touching the, the unified slab because we, it's mounted in in springs. And th all those details, okay, and, and that, all that analysis needs to happen early because as Josh has just mentioned, it could have a huge affection in, in, the, in the budget, in the final budget of the process. So regarding isolation, as we mentioned before, if we can make an acoustic side test first, that will, give, that will bring us the information and which are the conditions of that site and will give us the, the information of how much the environment, the surrounding environment could affect us, and even to the point to make it not feasible. Okay, so one of the answers to that question, no is an answer. If you're asking a, a professional team to get you advice, and your professional team is recommended to not do it that there because it will, it will have, a, you have big headaches or will not work properly, like try to pay attention. No, remember, we as consultants, we, we always want to do the project. We, we, don't, we don't like the, this is not the right space answer. <laughs> but if it's the answer, it, it is what it is. And of course, the robust statement and analysis. Now, internal room acoustics, okay, how your room will sound. And this is where, this is where we shine, this is where where we have a lot of fun. And this is where 4,000 studios could bring experience to the table. Okay, how to deal with reflection, absorption, diffusion, angles, architectural, all that mixed together. Remember, these, are the, these, these three are the only three things that we can do. We can play with reflection, angles of the walls, okay? Determine their acoustic coefficient, if the hard walls, absorptive, different kind of sorted materials on and play with diffusion. That, and those are the elements that we use to design, to that design development phase that we mentioned before. Those are the keys. Okay, so again, very simple concepts that have been studied in the last hundred years. Okay, direct sound, reflection, first re reflection, second reflections, and, uh, and we have the walls, we have the boundaries because we, we are inside the spaces. We are not designing uh, studios in the middle of the countryside, okay? So if we, if we play with the angles of the walls, and that's why you've seen that most of the theaters and recording studios have no, no orthogonal walls, although that's not a problem in that, but just need to deal with that, is because we are trying to avoid this confiltering, 
this delay of between the direct sound and, 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 a delay, and, and a delayed source, okay, and it is decreased level. That creates a phasing level problem and it basically makes that sound to sound not that good for the ear of the receiver, okay? Changing that wall angle will make that happen, okay? And that's what you, you, you've seen in every single project, uh, not only that we do, in general, playing with the, with the geometry helps in, in, that, uh, in that purpose. And I think that we have a poll uh, and, uh, uh, regarding immersive audio, and we have that question regarding immersive audio. Um, and I think that this is a good moment, Josh, if we, we want to talk about control rooms and symmetry, okay? And why it's our recommendation about control rooms and symmetry while we go through the stereo surround immersive process. Absolutely. It has everything to do with these two ears, right? Oh, yeah. And the fact that they're the same on both sides. So yes. they need to be receiving the same information. You need to trust that okay. the same so signal. So let's, let's say that this is a phase. <laughs> so it's, there is a symmetry. <laughs> So there's no argument against symmetry for a critical listening. Yeah. And, uh, and once this concept, this stereo listening position, triangle, perfect triangle, uh, evolves into a surround environment, there's less arguments to not having symmetry because now we have more complex sources, positions, heights, Etc. that will affect the listening position, that is making decisions at this particular point. If your, if your boundaries are not equally distanced from one side to the other, okay, this difference in distance, that this is not equal to this, will have an effect on your, on your listening experience, okay? So no argument of not having symmetry in control rooms. That's also a very good first advice to any project studio, home studio, or studio that, that is related to that. Um, and we see that a, a lot of people now it's, it's continue working in, uh, in stereo, but we're starting to have more people working in, in surround environments. And, and again, remember, so surround environments are now getting crazier with Atmos and with Aura and the other types of uh, playback systems, okay? So all those theaters, all those venues that are now having Atmos will require some kind of Atmos at the, con at the content creation space. So if you're starting a project and you already know that your outcome will be surround or Atmos mixes, you will have to start thinking what will happen on the ceiling of your space, okay? Because sooner or later, you're going to have something on that, uh, on that ceiling, okay? And sky is the limit in terms of the amount of speakers, and I'm, I'm sure we are going to be seeing more than that. Josh, you, I'm sure you have experiences with this complexity of, of spaces, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, there, you know, depending on which manufacturer you're working with, Dolby or Sony, RO, they all have different metrics by which to, to help you relate. This this room in particular was an RO for you. Hey guys, I have, um, there was a question that came in from David Kovach, which uh, just said, thanks for the session. John Storick, pretty complex question, so bear with me. John Storick control rooms pretty much always have been oriented to throw into a shorter distance counter. Um, to much of the other thinking and designs of throwing stereo monitoring into a longer distance of the room. Justin, I, I answered this one in the chat, actually. Yes, no, I, I realized that. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, bring someone in because he, uh, David goes on to talk about um, what's actually in John's head. Um, and I don't think I know quite what's in John's head, but I do know someone <laughs> who does know what's in John's head. Um, so, I think I found him. Okay, that's he's joining. Oh, that's great. John, I think you can unmute yourself and add your audio and add your video. Okay. Hi. Hey, How Johnny. 
How I'm, are you, man? Hey, how are you? I just got here. I'm, I've only been in for five minutes because of a prior engagement. Um, how many people are here, Justin? I, I didn't even see that number. Oh, uh, many... there's 150 people. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. I'm, I'm used to actually seeing people. So, hello. <laughs> Very cool. Um, Josh, I see every day, and Sergio, I get yelled at every day by, but anyway, it's very cool to be here. Um, that's, you just threw that question up, actually, as I was driving up. Um, I don't know who asked that question, but it's a pretty sophisticated question. I wouldn't say always, okay? There's, we need to throw the word always out of almost everything. We should always throw the word always out of everything we've been discussing, because there is no always. Um, which is, of course, the reason for programming. The reason why a lot of our rooms seem to be wider than deeper is mainly because as a room gets wider, the sidewalls move further away. And if you quickly look at that diagram that Josh and Serge threw up a while ago, um, uh, we've been using this diagram for, for a while. So actually, that's what I saw as soon as I came in. Um, as sidewalls move further away, sidewall first order reflections disappear. So it's a natural geometric way to get rid of those nasty first order reflections, which of course cause comb filtering, which is not what you want in your room. Comb filtering, uh, flanging is sort of another word for it, is, is a nice effect, but you don't want your room to do that without your permission, okay? This picture is a great one to sit on for this conversation. You will see geometry at work and you will see speaker positioning at work. Okay, those large monitors are probably just used for tracking. Okay, whereas critical mixing is being used on the ear level monitoring. Um, and that's a, that's a very interesting conversation to go into. How much near field or mid field or large monitoring um, are we using in our studios today? There's a com very compelling argument for midfield monitoring at ear level, mainly because it's, it, it will uh, eliminate a lot of these first order reflections and in particular console reflections. So these two, three, four concepts that I've just kind of thrown out completely out of order and I apologize, I get excited thinking about this, trying to answer that question that, that was asked is all about first order reflections. That's an interesting poll. I don't know whether we have that poll or not about monitoring, but if we don't. Um, it would no, be we, do, we do have it. Yeah, ah, here we go. Here we go. Here Let's we see, go. what do we consider? Actually, I'm really interested to see what everybody says about this one. I'm gonna answer this one based on what I see. Oh, it says I can't vote. Okay, well, anyway. But <laughs> Sorry, on, John, when you're an attendee. 170 other people. I'm very interested to see what this is and I'm not gonna give you the answer. Um, to what we're seeing uh, the most of, but I'm very interested to see this poll. But it's all about those first order reflections. If you can get geometry to do the work, uh, it's gonna be much easier than treatments. We can always get treatments to do the work. We can get absorption to do the work. We can get diffusion to do the work. But if you can get geometry, which is architecture, to do the work, it's just gonna be easier, okay? Um, and of course, the minute we get into immersive uh, control rooms, and you're looking at an example of an immersive, before was a, an immersive production room, this is an immersive delivery room or theater, things get more complicated, more speakers, more first order reflection problems. The tendency is for those rooms to get deader, which is of course non-musical. So immersive is tricky. There's no two ways about it. And I, I'm, I'm sure immersive is, is, is gonna come up, so. Uh, well, that's pretty, that's exactly what I thought it would be. I actually would have thought there'd be more midfield, but this is pretty consistent with what we're seeing. But anyway, I'm going to bow out and I'm going to let my, my partners and uh, my former students, my, now my partners and now my teachers, to be honest, um, take over. Anyway, very good to see everybody, although I'm not seeing anybody. Thank you, uh, Serge and, and Josh, and thanks, Justin, for organizing this. You can me back out please. Uh, John thank you so much for saying hi great seeing you great great to see you thank you Johnny Thanks. thank you and uh, and yes and and that's also related to our next slide that is basically in that acoustic signature determination which are the aspects that will affect uh, that acoustic signature of course reverberation and we are learning a, a lot 
on a frequency dependent point of view the different reverberation times that we want, the different decay times that we want uh, in a control room versus a live room in terms of reverberation time and how that affects that tightness, that, that, that uh, feeling that every sound and repeat that you're getting is not affected with extra uh, flowers that you don't want. Okay, and uh, speech intelligibility, that, that's also a value that we use in particular for live rooms we, and for lecture halls and for places where performance is uh, super important. Uh, so those are the values that we study, clarity, intelligibility, reverberation time, that affects the quality, the final signature of the room that we are building. And uh, Josh, you want to touch base about our acoustic labs? I think that you, you have a... You have fun with these spaces, correct? Mute. Correct, yeah, we use these spaces. Uh, we have the, the left two images are from our Basel, Switzerland office. The top right is from our Highland, New York office, just downstairs from me. And the bottom right is from our Berlin office. Uh, and then we use these to basically play back and test um, sonic characteristics of our designs before they're built. And we've even had clients in these spaces to make value judgments on like, room acoustics issues and isolation issues. Very valuable. Yeah. How yeah. do you get there uh, in use as often as we can? And before jumping to the case study that Josh will, will, will get us, a, a, quick, a quick glance on systems integration process. Again, all these rooms have technology. We need to take, take care of that. We study them on the, on the initial programming analysis. It's also part of that complex diagram that jo Josh explained at the beginning. We, we have to go schematic equipment lists, a mechanical and electrical narratives, a, the system design narrative, heat and power loads that will affect all the other trades, and then the construction documents. And again, program, the, everything starts uh, with, with the program. So here you have one program, studio, isobooth. Second program, BCR room with a webcast, a webcasting live room. And then we have this studio recording into this guy uh, as, a, as a large live room and the isobooth at the same time. So all that that is studied on the architectural point of view, then we have to study it on the system point of view in order to, to get Whatever vision the client has in terms of technology, okay, it could be as funky as this, okay, and make that system to coordinate with the other trades, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, okay, specifying the heat, the, the, the heat loads, the noise levels, the, the smoke gates, anything that is basic, and of course trying to have a perfect electrical system that will deliver whatever we need at this first at the perfect time. Uh, but in the end, just taking out the joke, uh, uh, we will have some kind of electrical riser diagram, an electrical drawing that someone needs to implement. If it's at home, this system could be maybe as simple as this. But there will be a system, there will be a panel, there will be something that we need to address. Power, clean power, technical power, normal domestic power, grounding, panel assessment, conduits, etc., etc. is all part of that dialogue. Okay, that is also an important part of our, of our project. So equipment list, heat and power loads of every single element of your facility that will affect the electrical and mechanical engineer. Okay, understand lighting, understand LED lights, personal normal lights, what we're going to use, circuits, etc. Then have a heat and power load that can be distributed through the, stake with the other trades. And uh, in the end, having a perfect diagram of the interconnection of every single year of the studio because this is where you finally understand everything that will happen on a digital analog network USB whatever connectivity you have in order to have a perfect studio remember this is a combination of architecture acoustics and technology that allows you to have a perfect environment a perfect uh, studio so, Josh, I pass in the torch to you on, on our case study. This, and we are just heading the final part of our webinar for you are attending and staying with us. Please, thank you.
So uh, this is a project we were hired to do with uh, Personas for their new headquarters back a few years ago. I'm sure most, if not all, of the folks on this are uh, familiar with Personas. They um, built a new headquarters with, of course, offices, and conference rooms, and shipping, and testing facilities. But in the heart of it, literally the heart, uh, they, they, they basically wanted a studio uh, because they wanted to not only talk the talk, but walk the walk of uh, the business they are in. Uh, when we received it, uh, it included these areas that, of our attention here that have been outlined with a large conference room. We won't really dig into that too much. Uh, the live venue room, which we see a little bit, but really want to focus in on the studio. Uh, this is what we received. This is not our drawing. Um, this is basically a graphic programming statement. They needed an audio control room, a studio, a video production room and you can see from the gesture that, that these the two production rooms the audio and the video are sort of their sharing studio and then they needed for quality control labs or test labs um, this is the first sketch actually i did this sketch um, and this is this is the design that ended up becoming uh, reality but we had to test it and we did three additional we formalized this this is this is the formal version of the hand sketch um, and you can see the, um, the control room there, right? And the ISO, one big studio, video control, uh, dedicated video ISO for overdubbing. And here is all of our, our, like, our little te <coughs> test labs. Um, uh, we did uh, some other versions, of course. Uh, you always have to test it, but you know, sometimes your first take is your best take. Uh, Game three, <clears throat> slightly different, sort of the funkier, funkier take, but the, the views weren't quite as good. So we circled back on that on that first gesture, um, and because because the two control rooms are sharing a, basically a live room, uh, we had to make sure that they could always work independently of each other. Um, and to do so, we needed three three wall system. Uh, the studio could basically work as a as an audio studio separate from a video studio. It could work as a uh, audio studio with overdub capabilities and then a, a large video facility for shooting product demos and Q&A type stuff. It could also work just as a mix room uh, in, in a concert with a video studio. Uh, so it had a lot of different ways to work and then of course just video production, post-production. Um, the shape of the control room threatened to be quite square, which, which we know uh, exacerbates the modal characteristics of the room. So one of the first things we did was say that the, the front wall was going to be rigid. And so that changes. Hey, the Josh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, we, we're getting a couple uh, comments that it's a little hard to hear you. If you can just oh. make sure um, it, it says that it sounds like the noise reduction algorithm is eating your voice. OK, I will try to speak up prevent that from happening. Thank you. Uh, and so, so we changed the ratio of the room, both in plan and in section, uh, so that we could get a very even and distributed modal response. Uh, we had plenty of height to play with, so height wasn't, a, height wasn't an issue. Uh, we did um, look at the ratios and try to you know, get those in where they were most, most beneficial. As you see on the next slide, um, we have a very even modal distribution to the control room, so that was, that was very that's critical for, for playback and for having good referencing. Uh, we did uh, have a, a dip around 47 hertz that we need, wanted to pay attention to as we got into design and um, used our low frequency modeling software. I believe we were using ABEC at the time to really track our pressure plots across the frequency band. Again, it's not just about pressure, but it's about pressure at what frequencies because it does change. And you can see here, this is an internal document, but we're highlighting areas of concern, areas that we, we need treatment uh, designed for the room. Uh, we Then we get into the design development, right? This is an exterior rendering, not ours, but from the architect. These are ours from the inside of the uh, studio. This is the control room, obviously, looking through, through to the ISO booth. This is a side look control room, right? So the front is dedicated to baffled in-wall speakers, LCD up top, so that really frees up. You don't, you're not trying to look in between the speakers to see into the control space. You are 
dedicating that space to technology. And then you can look sideways into the ISO booth, through the ISO booth into the live room or directly into the live room via that rear window. Uh, this is a, a view of the, the, the live room. We've got these corner windows. So we really maximized our, our vision in between the ISO booths and the live room spaces because they, they believe in a spirit of collaboration there over at Personas that, that's critical to them, the musician's experience. Here's one of the video production room, obviously uh, emphasis on the screens in front, um, and the, you know, switchers and, and mixers there in, in, in front of you. As they got hey, guys, hey guys, I uh, just wanted to give a time check. We have 20 minutes left and there's a lot of questions coming in. So just um, guys, uh, everyone, attendees, if we aren't able to get to all the questions, we will definitely follow up after the fact that we will try to get to them. Great. Being that this was new construction, ground up construction, we had the opportunity to do uh, split slabs. Basically, we dedicated a slab of, of poured concrete to each of the separate spaces. And here you can see, and we'll see pictures of it in a minute. Uh, that's the building slab in blue or purple, depending on how it shows on your screen. And uh, that's our triple wall there. So the triple wall is, is, is coupled to the building structure and the walls on the insides are both on their dedicated slabs so that we do have decoupling in between. And there you can see one of those triple wall foundation walls going through as it's being built on site. They actually laid this out with no roof in place. Interesting. There's another one. This is actually, this is the control room here, live room here, and video. And here's an ISO booth, an ISO booth. So we're kind of looking down the hall there. I imagine the push of trying to put up those dimensions on the ground without a roof, without reference, it's, that was a challenge. Absolutely, and, and it helps that, you know, this was developed in 3D so that we were, had a coordinated model with us and the architect and, and had a shorthand of, of dimension reference back and forth. Um, after framing has started, we we're basically standing in the live room looking at the ISO booth. There's the, there's the control room over here. Um, so we're looking, you know, to make sure that the, the walls on the inside are not going to the deck. They shouldn't connect. Um, they want to be on a dedicated system, right? Where here we have dedicated structures that do not touch rigidly the building structure. Uh, and then this is obviously our third wall in the middle, which does touch the building structure. Yeah, remember when we spoke uh, in our acoustics basics about uh, mass and decoupling and the room within a room type of construction, you, you're now seeing this as, as real as it can be. This is not a scheme, this is a reality. Uh, this is uh, one of the boundary types that was that was used, which had, in, had utilized CMU, filled CMU, so that they could, this is for the live space, they actually put a venue so that they could test their live speakers, and they wanted to be able to crank it up as loud as they needed to, to really put the speakers through their paces without bothering the rest of the, the office. Uh, so we, we went to a, a more massive EMU, which allows us quite a bit more low frequency attenuation. And again, decoupled inside. Uh, one of the ways we get decoupling um, with, with while still achieving our structural contact, right, our um, connection is using isolated wall clips. So you can see here, there's a little bit of rubber here so that this rigid part of metal that's attached to this stud does not, attach, does not rigidly connect with this housing, this rigid housing, which is attached to this wall so that there's an, there's an interruption of the vibration that could be traveling through and into here. So we maintain our decoupling that way. And there's a few manufacturers who make their versions of this product. Insulation going in, uh, watch out, it's dusty on a project site. Here are our wall layers going in. There's that first layer of gypsum here, second layer of plywood that provides you basically blocking anywhere. And then our final third layer of, of gypsum. Um, gypsum starting to go in, temporary blocking still in place. There's a view you can see gyp, ply, gyp, gyp, ply, gyp. All of this right in between here is our airspace. And that helps with the low frequency attenuation, right? So we got mass, mass, and then we got our airspace. And it's insulated 
and they are connected, but they're using those isolation clips. So they are decoupling that way. The venue with the JIP board is starting to go in, and we get infrastructure, and we start to get the ducts, we start to get our conduits, so that our low voltage system, our, you can see how complicated it is, how to connect all of your AV panels, how to connect the, you know, the console to the, you know, the microphone, how it gets to the console is a, is a circuitous path sometimes. Uh, con, you know, conduit here to an AV back, back box, uh, double pane windows, uh, triple pane windows there with the, with the three wall system. Uh, you have to, have, you know, we generally want to see a, a layer of glass for each boundary. Uh, see the conduit going in in the back, very complicated. Uh, or should I say complex? And you, you don't want to you want to forget that layer in the project. The window um, almost done with sheet rocking here, which is good. And then you can hey, see Josh, a question coming in. Um, can you tell us the best solutions for controlling low frequency in our small control rooms? Is it geometry, or is it treatments, or is it both? Yes, it's, it's, we have to, in the, the smaller the room gets, the, the more we have to rely on geometry and treatments to work together to, to do that. Because as you, as you know, the, the Schroeder frequency gets higher. Um, we have to be able to control that or it's going to run away from us and it won't be, uh, you won't get a reasonable and, and it's also related to isolation because in the end, if we are going to have massive walls that will contain a lot of energy, those are, are going to be very rigid, very stiff. Yeah, and that will. also has an affection of, ha of that low frequency management inside of the room because the, room, the energy is not going to be anywhere. So we need more efficient way of capturing very precise frequencies. And this is what we studied during that low frequency analysis process that Josh was mentioning before. Right. And this is actually this right here shows you one of our methods for controlling that we, we put a soffit in which has is doing a triple maybe more duty uh, we're running ducts through it we're using it to house uh, lights so that we don't make holes right in the um, in the acoustic boundary the isolation boundary but it's also it's located in a in a corner which is where a buildup of pressure can occur and helps to uh, alleviate some of that pressure by with the with the insulation and here you can see some pegboard here that pegboard we use quite a lot um, to help us absorb some of those low frequencies and, and broad, more broadband frequencies as well this is a soffit in the live room conduit coming down hvac uh, another view of the live room again massive soffits moving around ductwork lots of insulation lots of absorption in there uh, this is the front i think of the or maybe it's the back of the BC. The back is the back. Yep. And uh, sidewall treatments, rear wall treatments, uh, lots of conduit, lots of power. And um, looking at uh, this is all substantial completion by the contractor right before the AV equipment starts to be installed. Uh, so you can see that furniture starting to go in, um, but the uh, finishes are all in, the treatments are all in, the doors are mounted, it's painted, the lights are in and on. Uh, this is the final presentation drawing uh, and some of the final pictures, right? You can see the light grid, you can see the treatments hung, the fabric wall. This is where we saw all those conduits coming down that are now hidden in, in the treatment. Uh, the acoustic doors, here's a triple window looking in. You can see there would be the engineer sitting back through there. And now they can get to work. Control room, of course, uh, with the the cutout for the future uh, center channel that they would use in the future. Using, and, course, and by the way, you, you oh. can you can witness that the solution. There's nothing crazy. The solution, fabric fabric front wall that hiding that stiff wall that Josh mentioned before. Fabric brush panels, diffu wooden diffuser, wooden reflection absorption resonator cloud. So we, we are not using materials coming from Mars. Mars, although this is for a corporation, they ask for a solution that could be easily replicated or can feel like someone's home. Okay, because their uses of, of personas products are 
typical project studios. Okay, so that was one of the goals in this in this particular design in the program that program analysis. Please do not use any anything that nobody could have, have the potential of having it in their own studio. So again, that that design, that full design, that Josh, uh, thanks Josh for that uh, case study explanation, uh, explained to us. It's it's a collaboration between that dream, the dream of the user, okay that makes it the architectural, the conditions of the, that building that we have, the acoustic design with all these program configurations, the addition of the technology, the, te the equipment, etc., and its integration into one uh, unified design effort. Okay, and this is something that I, I used to, when I see that something is going north in terms of that program and analysis, okay, what we are talking about? Because sometimes we are in that, those initial meetings and people are starting to talk about the lava lamp instead of speaker placement, okay, or program analysis. Okay, so we need to be super focused on what we are doing, okay, because if, if, we, lose, if we lose track on that, certain things will go north and will not, uh, will not find the right solution, okay. It's like if you're building a theater, the most important is the theater, not the lobby. The lobby is important, but most important is the theater itself because that's the main purpose of that building. And no, no limits in terms of creative, creativity and uh, dreams uh, for, for that. Uh, so we are now ending our webinar. Josh, I don't know if you want to add something more. We have some eye candy, some, some pictures, because they, they were asked before for some pictures about different samples of studios. But um, we are still listening and we are still learning, correct? Uh, Absolutely. Every project is a, an opportunity to, learn, to work with someone new, to learn something new, to do something new. And never liked copy pasting solutions. Um, but we do like building on our knowledge base to improve and provide these these spaces so that these spaces can provide music back to us. Absolutely, absolutely. Ba basically, the, the, those dreams are the ones pushing our boundaries of technical and creative uh, uh, limits, okay? The, the, those dreams that are asking for innovation in the way of solving this, this it, they are the same problems. This, the problems are the same. What pushes those boundaries are the dreamers, okay, the people with their dreams for the projects, and our ambition of getting to the next level, always trying to push that, the, the, those limits, okay? And again, thanks for the music and thanks from Jimmy that touched uh, John's life in 1969, and uh, that serendipity moment evolves into a lifetime career that now touches a lot of people and a lot of projects around the world. And, and Justin, I, I will give you the, the ball back to you while we are showing some, some images and you can ask other questions. That's great, you guys. Yes, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Um, there are a lot of questions. Um, I'm just gonna kind of, there's one that looks like it's come up a couple times. Um, around curious what progressive building practices you see making their way into studio construction, sustainable materials, net zero, wood frame. Um, and this also, uh, there's two, the, another question is how do you uh, balance sort of uh, lead concerns and, you know, how do you, uh, how do you focus still on being practical? So just a couple questions there around sustainable building practices as well as how do you still maintain practicality while trying to bring in other materials. I can field this one if you like, Sergio. Please, please go ahead. And, so, and if you, you guys want to open up the QA, Sergio, I know you have access to it. If you want to cherry pick some as well, please go ahead. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, obviously sustainability, being responsible designers is a huge, huge topic and one that we're highly invested in. Um, we've done a lot of the research about green building practices, materiality, low VOCs, you know, for just from an environmental standpoint, from a health standpoint, all, and, and everything in between. Ultimately, we take our clients, we follow their lead on this, not to overuse a pun, um, so that if it's important to them, we can bring as much as possible to the, to the table, right? We have a lot of projects that are lead 
certified, even some time, some uh, that are platinum. Um, and and so we can do our part to provide that in terms of uh, materiality or intelligent sourcing, that sort of thing. Um, but you know the smaller projects, particular, particularly ones where the, this is not a priority for the client. Um, sometimes some of these strategies can, can add cost, and there's not you know, any budget to provide the backup for that. It, it sometimes gets deprioritized. Um, and again, we have to take our follow our client's lead on that. But it is very important to us. And we are looking, always looking at ways to find local materials to, to find stuff that doesn't have to be shipped, find stuff that doesn't have range manufacturing processes, particularly unhealthy ones, um, so that we can use that going forward. Yes, our, our ratio of uh, watts per square feet is very bad. <laughs> it's, it's usually very bad. So, and, but on the other side, our acoustic contained spaces keep very well their conditioning. So although we, we have some heat coming up inside of the space and we need air conditioning 24 seven, okay, normally once the space is in, in, in regime, in regime uh, we, they are able to keep the temperature nice. So uh, I, I think that the, the strategy is trying to use uh, the right lighting, okay, try to, to, to wisely request the right amount of power Okay, that's, that's how we can help that lead to that sustainable uh, goal. And, and of course, trying to use local materials. Okay, try to use local wood, try to lose the fabric that is being uh, presented in the, in the site where this project is located. Okay, remember we are, work, we are building projects around the world, so we have the chance of experiment with a lot of different manufacturers and materials and recycled materials all over the place. But uh, just using this slide as example, this is the typical room that we are facing today, okay? A small, a small size, what we call a small size production, mixing, tracking, writing room with a vocal booth. This is the trend. This is what's happening today. Sometimes these vocal booths do not exist and they just track vocals inside of the control room. So we have one room filling all purposes, okay? And then you have a better headphone system when you have multiple users in the same room, but nothing that technology will not allow us to, to play with, okay? And of course, we, we love the, the big rooms. Why not? Okay, because we love music and we love, we love large spaces. But the tendency today, mid to small, all in one or with a small live room, okay? This is a... This is a project we uh, finished last year in Brazil. Uh, the, you can see the, the property is in the middle of nowhere. And that window here is this window here. So, and uh, every piece of wood is coming from recycled wood from the forest surrounding it. So that's our approach of how to feed that need of sustainability Aesthetics, acoustics, et cetera, et cetera. John, you're back here. Good. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, microphone, uh, your microphone. Sorry. We, we, had, a, we, had, a, we had a question uh, specific to John um, that was really <coughs> about, you know, uh, to John, you've been designing studios for 50 years. Um, 50 years from now, what will be different? What will not be different? Um, what does the next 50 years hold for us? <laughs> boy, oh boy, I, don't, I want to meet the guy that, that wrote that question. That's, that's not fair. Um, <laughs> that'll be a good way for us to end, and then you'll send me that guy's email so I can just tell him not to come to the next webinar, or she, <laughs> whoever it is. Um, you know, that, don't remind me about the 50 years. That just means I'm old, but still working every day. Um, Surgeon Josh, thank you so much. I, um, we must be doing something right, at least some of the time. And, and um, so, you know, 50 years from now, I'm going to quote something, uh, a mentor of mine, good friend, he's not with us anymore, Chris Stone, who founded Record Plant, 
he wrote a seminal article many years ago. It, it could have been 20 years ago. And it stuck with me all this time. It was called uh, Motherships and Satellites. And basically his premise was that there would always be really, really large, what he called mothership studios. You're looking at one of them right now. Um, and if you went back to a lair surge, that would be what I thought at one moment in time was maybe the premier or one of the premier mothership studios. It was a destination studio, but that they would be hundreds, literally thousands of satellite studios, which now have been called project studios or home studios, or budget studios, or, um, you know, bedroom studios or e-studios, a new term we're developing. You could, you could stay on that one if you wanted to. Oh, That's sorry. Fine. Um, um, and, and, and what he, the premise he made was that we should be throwing away the a term, let's throw away the terms commercial studios. Those are marketing terms and business terms. I don't really care too much about those. I always thought that when I read that, it stuck with me and I think it's truer than ever. I think 50 years from now, for me, there, first of all, we're going to have studios. We're going to have more studios than ever. So whoever thinks we're going to have less studios is simply not understanding what's going on. Uh, we can hardly keep up with the requests for studios. They will probably get smaller. Sergio's point is correct. The lines that define commercial studios and non-commercial studios and control rooms, live room versus combined rooms, all those kinds of lines that we're looking at now um, that we're paying attention to, they're just going to get fuzzier and fuzzier and grayer and grayer. Um, and we're going to see environments that are in fact studios that maybe don't even really look like studios. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure about that. They're going to get less expensive. That's been a trend that has not stopped and I doubt if it will stop. The equipment will become less expensive. It will become smaller. It will become easier to use. It will probably become better. Although it won't become better linearly, it'll probably have bumps. Okay, so it'll get better, and then there'll be a sinking sag, and 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 um, uh, then it'll. But it will continue to get better and better. Um, uh, so I imagine that these trends uh, will happen. Some things that won't change. The biggest one. And I've had this discussion with lots of producers. I think there's always going to be a desire for a group of musicians to get into the same room and play music um, and be recorded. And um, although I'm not sure if that trend, I, I, if, although I can't guarantee that that will, that will happen, I certainly can wish that that will happen. And I will end and maybe we'll all end together on the first note, excuse the pun that Sergio and Josh started with, we're musicians. Almost everybody that works in our organization are, are musicians. Uh, most of us are frustrated musicians. I was, when I graduated, I, I, I actually thought I was gonna be a musician when I graduated college. I was making more money as a musician. Life changed on a dime. That was just some good fortune. I started to hang around with extraordinary musicians and actually they intimidated me. I realized I could not get I, I woke up one day and said, I don't think I can play piano as well as Leon Russell. And I stopped playing and that probably was not a good thing. Most people could not play piano as well as Leon Russell. And, uh, um, but luckily, uh, fate had a different path for me and, and it all worked out pretty well. So I think there's always going to be recording environments where musicians want to get together and play music. And uh, although I can't guarantee it, I certainly, I certainly hope for that. And I certainly hope that Sergio and Josh and everybody that works with us hopes for that. Um, yeah. Because if there's no music, more or less the last hour and a half doesn't make any sense. Okay, so without music, you can pretty much throw away the entire webinar. Um, without and, music, we can throw our, our lives. We can throw I, away I, pretty I, much. I don't music. want to be in a world without music. So, anyway, once again, I'm, I'm going to say goodbye, but I'll let Justin do the formal goodbyes. Thank you, everybody. No, thank you, Johnny. Thanks, John. Um, thank you, everyone. Sergio, yeah. Josh, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you, everyone, for who attended.
Um, you know, please join us again. We have uh, Adventures at the Low End coming up on July 30th um, with a number of members of the WSDG team. Um, a lot of the low end questions would be better suited asking yeah. asked in that mm -hmm. meeting. Um, follow us uh, on social media. Uh, sign up for our newsletter to get notified about all of the events coming up. Um, the webinars will be available, the, the recordings will be available um, on YouTube as well as WSDG.com. Um, you can see our webinars page in the education section of our website. Um, and again, all of the questions that were asked, we will be reviewing them. Um, we'll also be sending a survey tomorrow to everyone who attended. Um, please give us your honest feedback on how we did. Um, how, how many phone, how many times John's phone rang, um, whoever's mowing the lawn outside of his office, please give us that feedback. Um, it really Justin, helps. Justin, you didn't tell me about shutting off the phone, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that all helps us to create a better experience for you and hopefully you continue to get a lot out of what we're able to produce. Again, thank you everyone. Thanks. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Justin. You. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Good luck. Everybody. Ciao, ciao. And that concludes it, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a great day, evening, wherever you are.